Attention, please. Eastern Airlines Flight 19, now ready for departure. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. There's enough land here to hold all of the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. We call it Epcot. will be our experimental prototype city of the morning. Welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast, taking you back to the vacation kingdom of the world, the way it was, and the way it is in your memories. All right, welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast. I'm your host, Todd McCartney, and tonight is episode 38, Communicore East. So sitting in with me as always tonight is uh, Mr. Hal Bowers. How are you doing tonight, Hal? Aloha, I'm doing fantastic. Nice, nice. Mr. J.T. Couser. How's it going, Todd? Good, good. Taking care of a little discipline this week at the school. Yes, <laughs> yes and fighting a cold, so if my voice sounds uh, a little off, that's why for regular listeners. We'll give you a little pass on that. Yeah. Right. You have any menthol or anything you can get yeah, through it? Good old-fashioned antibiotics. There we go. And as always as well, Mr. Brian P. Miles. How's it going tonight, Brian? Greetings and salutations from Philadelphia, the city where our nation began. All right, so let's get right into corrections and comments. Uh, last month, guys, uh, or last two months, actually, we had a number of episodes there on the Polynesian Resort. And uh, Joe wrote in to us uh, because some, we, we talked about the luau, how you and I spoke about that. We, we couldn't confirm where the puppets came from, but we talked about how about uh, some of the, there were some character appearances that have changed uh, over, over the years. Um, uh, so Joe wrote, wrote in from, from more of a recent story that the uh, Hawaiian roller coaster ride song from Lilo and Stitch was in there, uh, but no character appearances. So I know the characters were very prominent in the 80s. So Joe, for, thanks for uh, sending us a little information on what's going on there now. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll try to dig in a little more and find out when uh, some of these Luau character appearances did happen. But uh, So JT, I'm going to pass it over to you. We've got a, a bunch of Lister mail this month, don't we? Yes, we're doing pretty solid on this. Lots of good questions. Um, just, yeah, lots of stuff. Uh, first one is from Eric. He said he recently discovered our podcast, and he's getting caught up with the uh, back catalog. He lives in Orlando. He's done quite a bit of construction work with WDI through the years. He had a question based on the uh, original or possibly original uh, Disney scouted location. How you're going to have to help me with this, uh, this city named Eustace. Eustace, yes. Got it. Uh, in Sorrento. He has a co-worker that claims that uh, his father surveyed the property for Disney, and that was possibly one of the original preferred locations. Is that any, any truth to that? Well, I mean, they looked all over Florida. They looked on the... <clears throat> they looked certainly in that area. Um, they looked south. They looked everywhere. They looked Daytona Beach. I thought the two uh, finalists were the Orlando area where they ended up and Ocala were the two big like finalists where they had to decide which right. two to, to build at. And that's kind of where they're talking about. So it is it is a little bit... It's not... Eustace is a little... Yeah, I think that you're closer to the Ocala era, area. I don't know if it got to the point of doing survey work. That's certainly possible. He he mentions that there are wed survey monuments in the area, which now that I find kind of surprising because the whole thing was done under such a veil of secrecy. Leaving something out in the open that said Disney on it would have been <laughs> like the exact opposite of what they what they would have done back then. So that that part of the story I'm not sure about. Um, there was also a uh, a welcome center up kind of in that area though too off of um 75 right for a while i mean definitely that area was looked at eventually um they ended up picking the orlando area primarily because of the convergence of the two highways so you know i4 and and 75 or 535 one of those there was a route that cut north and south and a route that cut east and west and i can't remember uh what the north and south one is right now but 
So, so how that welcome center that you mentioned, that was kind of like really for the those driving down to Florida to say, oh, you're, you're close, you're almost here, you know, you've, you've gone through south of the border, <laughs> you've right. been through Georgia, uh, look, look, let's get you more excited. Or those that may have been passing on 75 to go to Tampa, why don't you, you know, change your route a little bit and come down to come down to Orlando on your way? I seem to recall there was also something about Eisner thinking that they might set up a series of these because mm. he had some feedback from people about sort of the, the state of restrooms for travelers. Oh. So, I, so I think he had a thought of setting up these kind of Disney branded rest areas uh, along the highway potentially. That's awesome. And this was kind of a test for that. So uh, it I got to go in a couple of times to that one and they had merchandise that you could buy. You could get tickets. They had, you know, information on the parks and everything. And they had clean bathrooms. And that was really the one thing that they were pushing was the, the clean bathroom thing. So as far as I know, that was the one and only one that they built. Very cool. Yeah. Well, thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. All right. Next one I wanted to do. Um, this is from, it's a short one, but it's from a guy named Anderson. Look, you guys like this one. Hi, guys. I'm a huge fan of Retro WDW. I'm 11 years old and never got to see Retro WDW. I am learning so much. Keep up the great work. So I wanted to read that, give a shout out to Anderson, and say thank you for listening. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for writing in, Anderson. You're definitely one of our younger visitors even my own son who's the same age as you doesn't listen to his own dad so <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> no every that's now a, and then that's all right todd it. neither do we oh oh good oh yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> your son doesn't eat your dog food as you that's said. right that's, that's right he doesn't, doesn't eat our dog food but uh yeah that's awesome anderson we hope that you're learning a lot from this um i know we in, really enjoy talking to to everybody and, and and telling the stories and telling the history of the theme parks um so uh, Hopefully, uh, this will give you a really good understanding uh, of, of what it was like back then. All right. Well, thank you again, Anderson. Uh, next up was from our uh, friend Nate. Uh, he said, hey, wanted to challenge something in from episode 37 regarding the salon and barber shop at the Contemporary. He can vouch that it was still open in 2003 because as a cast member, that's where he used to get his hair cut. You want to say a fellow uh, named Grady cut his hair there. So maybe Grady's a listener. Uh, many times he uh, would pack up a costume in his backpack, take a shuttle bus there and get his hair cut, then take another bus over to the studios to get back to work. He says he thinks uh, it was in 2005 when it may closed, but um, he doesn't remember what he did for haircuts uh, in 2005 besides maybe on Main Street or the salon at the cast services at the studio. Enjoy the show. And um, yeah, so... Yeah, uh, cast members from the time and before tell us that Grady was there for years. And then when the shop closed at the Polynesian, uh, they moved, Grady moved over to the Contemporary that still was operating a beauty salon slash barber shop there and cut hair for the last few years there and then retired uh, to parts unknown. Uh, so he was one of the two guys there. And the stories uh, told by the cast members from the time was that the other guy that cut their hair there for years and years was really mean. <laughs> he was like kind of surly. <laughs> I don't want him to cut my hair. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Grady had these big, thick Coke bottle. Gla well, we have a picture of it. I, did we share that when we did the Polynesian episode? I don't remember, but we have a pic. I think we tweeted yeah, we have it. A, yeah, we have a picture in the barbershop that we'll make sure is included in the in in the article and tweeted out there so i'm picturing enzo from that seinfeld episode that doesn't let anybody else cut jerry's hair that's the <laughs> um all right so thank you again for that about the barber shop two more quick ones here all right todd this one's for you this is from nicholas sure. d he says he was wondering what the background music was used in uh the episode uh, he commented on retro food, and I know that's, I thought he was referring to this last episode. I'm not sure which episode this is. Yeah, so I had to go back because I, I had to play it because I can't remember, I couldn't remember exactly what I had placed on there in the background. And that's one of the few episodes where we did play something all the way through. <clears throat> and uh, it, it was, I was, we found it on YouTube. It was a two hour mix or so called Retro Lounge Mus Music Lovely 70s. So I think it's two hours worth of just, some kind of cool grooving lounge music that just worked since we were talking about the old restaurants and lounges. So there you have it. So just 
Google that up and uh, you'll you'll find it. Next up is a email we got from Dan PenQ. PenQ. I don't know how to say the last name. Dan. Uh, he recently discovered the show and he absolutely loves it. Thank you, Dan. He recently purchased an eBay copy of the Dreamfinder Airship Blimp Blueprint, uh, apparently used in the Scalida Show Plagoon Show in 1985-ish. Do you know if the blueprint is authentic? He'd love to know more about the Scalida Soap Show too, and specifically this blimp. So uh, I did some research on that, and according to Disney historian Jim Corcus, uh, the original idea for the show was to have Dreamfinder uh, come out to kick off like the battle between the airships and the dragon boats. Um, if you what we're talking about here is a show called. Scope, which was in the mid 80s and it's absolutely insane if you get a chance to look it up uh it's nuts um that's the phrase that we threw around a while the story had something to do about like dragons eat gumdrops but if yeah. you drop gumdrops in the water it makes remember uh we at destination d a few years back ron, yeah. ron logan walked us through the whole show <laughs> yeah it was like wait oh yeah, dragons eat gumdrops, but if you drop it in the water, then it makes an evil. I can't remember I will, now, something I evil. I will send a, a, a ping out to our friend Michelle at Minnesota Mini on Twitter, who took copious notes that day and occasionally shares with us uh, the full backstory of the gumdrop-powered dragon something or other. It was very trippy. Oh yeah, gumdrops. Oh, gumdrops make rainbows, but if you drop a gumdrop in the water, then it makes dragons, and dragons eat rainbows. <laughs> 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 Anyways, um, according to Jim Corcus, uh, the idea of the show originally was to have Figment come out in the elaborate balloon that you found the blueprints for on eBay. Unfortunately, because of the winds in Florida, um, it was deemed that. That would not be a practical thing to build and use in the show. It would be fairly uncontrollable. So it was not built and it ended up not being used in the show. But the blueprints do still exist and you managed to buy one. So congratulations on that. All right, Dan. Well, there you go. Thanks for your question. Cool. Well, um, so that closes up the mailbag. If you'd like to write us, podcast at retrowdw.com. Send us a tweet, uh, message us on the website. Uh, Instagram direct message, however you want to get in touch with us, we will uh, get to as many as we can, right back to as many as we can, and you might even get on the show. All right, thanks, JT. And uh, it is time for this month's audio rewind. So uh, before we listen to this month's, let's take a listen to last month's audio rewind. You could fly to a plaza where the people play at a Mexican fiesta. In that land of Ole. All right. Well, if you guessed, if you had wings, you are correct. Now, I'll tell you guys, I know we, we, we said we'd make it easier. And I th- we got as many answers in this month as we did in the past two months. So it was easier. And I'll say the percentage of correct numbers was extreme. It was like a 99% were correct. But alas, we can only have one winner. That winner will receive the Epcot opening medal that uh, Ryan McKinney actually donated to us. He gave us a number of different things, including the medal that we'll get get to that is in the prize pot. Uh, So the winner is Brooke Outson. Congratulations, Brooke, for submitting the correct answer. So we'll get your prize right out to you shortly. All right, so we've got a prize for this month. Um, I have here the Epcot Center. This is compliments of the Eastman Kodak Company. Uh, It's the famous wheel brochure where you open it up and you you turn the wheel of what you want to see and it tells you what the the building looks like and what you get to do inside. Uh, And on the back, the best part is if you turn the wheel, it also tells you all about Kodak cameras. So guys, uh, pick a a camera from the 80s. What do you want to hear about? We got the Disc 4000. uh, We got the 960 Instant. Think of all the pictures you missed. Because the flash on your camera wasn't ready. Oh, the pictures you missed before the Kodak disc. The Kodak disc camera knows when to flash and can flash again this fast. So you don't have to miss a knee slapping, hand clapping, foot stomping moment. Oh, the pictures you missed before the Kodak disc. 
Get that. All right. So you selected the disc. Let's go with the. Uh, <laughs> you selected we're go the with disc. C. The disc eight thousand uh, has rapid sequence capability in any bright light. LCD travel alarm clock, a self timer. <laughs> what? There's yeah. an alarm clock built into <laughs> the camera. A travel alarm clock. And it's an LCD. <laughs> That's like the first iPhone. Plus all the features of the six thousand. So hold on, I have to turn the wheel. Can I look at the six thousand? Yeah, close-ups up to 18 inches, a built-in cover handle, oh, and plus all the features of the 4000. Was that the silver one or the black one? Uh, so we started with the black and gold. That was the okay. 8000. The 6000 was all black, and now we're down to the silver, which just has automatic built-in flash, a motorized oh. film advance, an instant flash cycle. And get this, five-year warranty. Huh. <laughs> Grainy photos not included. <laughs> <laughs> that camera, if anybody remembers, it, met the demise. So, but think about that. This is brilliant marketing because you turn the wheel. It's a disc camera. It's really, really kind of a cool piece of uh, of memorabilia. So that will go in, and uh, uh, this will be the prize if you can guess this month's audio rewind. All right, if you think you know the answer to this month's Audio Rewind, send your guesses to podcast at retrowdw.com. All entries should be received before April 9th, 2018. And with that said, we always pick a winner from all the correct entries, but we also have the prize pot, which we give away uh, twice throughout the year, in, in June as well as in December. And JT, our, our scribe, as always, is keeping a list. So JT, what do you what do you have going on in the prize pot? We need to add something to it, but... What do we have? All right. For January, we have Epcot posters. February, we have the retro WDW embroidered hat and the McFargo Christmas card. And last month, we have the Epcot coin slash medal in honor of the Olympics. That's right. Now That's we need right. our new prize. All right. And you have something, is my understanding. Yes, I got this special because uh, when I was down there for the marathon weekend, we were talking about the, the Air Force One. Mm -hmm. um, or the recreation of it, because it's apparently different. We were analyzing the pleats and the eye size and everything, and we think it's a new one. But I have an original Air Force One a pin to Ooh. throw in the prize, prize pot um, that I found on the Internet, and it's like, you know, pin trader style with the little back and everything, and it's new in the package, so that's going to go in the prize pot, an Air Force One pin. Awesome. All right. So there we go. We got the big prize pot. So every entry, whether it's correct or not, will be entered into the prize pot drawing in June 2018. All right, guys. Well, it's time to take you back to Communicore. Now, we had a choice of uh, doing Communicore East or West, and uh, we thought about it, and uh, we also put it to a vote. And you, the listener, have chosen Communicore East as our first one. So that's where we're going to start. But we are going to give a little background to you know, what Communicore was, how it got started, uh, a little bit about the building. So um, you know, how you... You remember Communicore really well. I had tons of fun there. There's photos of, uh, of, of me visiting... I know you, you, know, you spent a lot of time there. And in a way, Communicore was a pavilion that, that people kind of forgot about in a way, right? I mean, you always went to the big rides, but there was so much to do in East and in West. Oh, yeah. There was a time. I mean, I'm trying to think. I, we probably spent as much time in there as anywhere else, you know, mm -hmm. just because of the, where it was located. So, you know, everyone goes on, you walk in, you go on Spaceship Earth. It's like because it's right there. And Communicore is the next thing. So, I mean, I know, I know we wandered through and when there are lots. Right. And being in the center was actually very pivotal to the, to the design. If we go all the way back in time uh, of you know, where they wanted to be, uh, it was meant to be the central plaza area. And uh, Communicore, uh, JT, you, you didn't get to visit, but what do you think Communicore is supposed to mean or stand, stand for? Do you, do you know? Um, I mean, I would picture, I, you know, my limited knowledge is something with long distance phone calls of the era at&t talking about <laughs> communicating with you know video phones that didn't exist yet that sort of stuff but that also connects with spaceship earth so i don't know that whole area i'm not really well, sure and that's exactly what i thought it was as a kid but it was actually meant to be the community core 
Oh. Not communication core. It's actually community core, which is interesting. So what was it really meant to be? I mean, it, you know, when we look at what community core was, uh, it was scientific. It was technical. It was math and engineering, kind of like what they talk about as STEM programs in, 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 kid, it's in schools and stuff for kids now. And don't forget, this is a time when computers were brand new. Um, and and we're, they needed a way to demonstrate how computers and technology can really, really change your life. I have out here, uh, this is the, the famous Walt Disney's Epcot Bible book, if you will. And and they have a couple bullet points of what they wanted to accomplish with CommuniCore. And, and he, the, the first one you guys are going to laugh at. Talk to a computer and have it answer us. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Alexa. <laughs> exactly. We do this every day. <laughs> Sorry if I uh, just set off everybody's Alexa in their kitchen right. when we're listening. <laughs> <laughs> She's all laughing now, everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, contribute, contribute to our own opinions and current issues and ongoing poll. I mean, the Twitter polls and everything. Check our next travel destination. Um, you know, experience what it's like to pilot a space shuttle. And there's a couple concepts we're going to go through that you're going to see made its way uh, into, in, in, into other areas of, of the resort. So... Originally, we were going to have anywhere between two and four buildings, and uh, they were also proposed to have the Wedway People Mover going around. And but the concept, then the reason, quote unquote, that the buildings are as tall as they are is because the People Mover was supposed to go around the edge. So, what do you have on that? Yeah, we have we have. I have not seen the plans, but I have talked to people who said that they have seen it, and it was incredibly awkward. But that was an <laughs> idea that was floated even past. Uh, even past the 80s, like in the mid 80s, they even thought about adding that as a as an addition. Mm-hmm. So apparently, it was a thing. Yeah, you know, and they also had this idea here that you know it was going to be a smaller space for smaller companies that maybe couldn't make it into the pavilions. So you know, and and the also the idea was to change them out, make them fresh. That whole evolving concept of new technologies is what what Walt had said Epcot was. So it's kind of a little bit of that all, all thrown in. Now, after the Wedway was thrown out, came down to two buildings, we got, what did we get? We got 100,000 square feet, six different areas, two restaurants, a store, some meeting hall, and the central computer system, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And it was really designed with very open, easy to navigate. If you've ever been through Interventions, that that to me is kind of like the, the contemporary. I get lost. I mean, I go into Interventions, <laughs> I can't figure out where I am, right? <laughs> yeah. The, if you ever look at a map of what Communicore was... It was simple, easy corridors with 90-degree turns, open breezeways, these, these corridors that ran the whole length of the side. You really knew where you were. Um, and the ne- really neat thing about that, I, I forgot about this house, that all of the display areas were sunken down a couple steps. So there was yeah. a delineation <clears throat> between footpath and what you were going to go do and experience. That was neat to be able to, I mean, it seemed such like a simple little thing, but just being able to like walk down a ramp or yep. go down some stairs, it really, it really did help break up the space. Yep, it, it really did. So the other thing that was interesting about the way that this was designed, and, and if you know CommuniCore the way it was when it was open, uh, there were two of these half crescent moons, if you will, or um, portions of a circle. Uh, the outside walls were all glass. And the idea was that if needed... And when they were ready, they could expand by just taking that exterior wall down, building it out 50 feet, building, extending the roof and adding on. And and the plan was that they could go all the way out to the monorail beam encompassing that, <laughs> which <laughs> I think is pretty cool. And actually, when it opened, there was already plans for expansion. Bell Labs was going to go up in the Northeast Corridor. We didn't get that until that, that Northeast Corridor didn't get... Um, uh, expanded until interventions went in the early 90s. Uh, the Odyssey restaurant was going to be attached to the southeast corner. Um, and we all know, you know all about the, the, the sinkhole and the lake that's there, and it got its own own little area. Um, and then it did get some expansion later on as well that did actually eventually go through. Um, the Sunshine Terrace was expanded in 82, the Centorium in 87, and the Teacher Center in 89. We're going to talk all about a little bit more about those that, uh, coming up here. Um, but the, I think one of the key elements that people forget now, now is that when you walk down the center, and again, this is the central plaza, community core, the lakes and the green spaces and all that stuff that used to be there is gone. And there was such a sense of, I don't want to say calm, but it, was, <laughs> it wasn't as hectic. And it was really, really a neat place that drew you into the buildings and, and you wanted to be there. 
it was just it was actually just a really neat architectural space to walk through you know kind of that same feeling you might get if you walk through new york city and you go to like lincoln center or someplace mm-hmm. it's just neat to be surrounded by all that lincoln center is a, that's a great analogy because the glass and the imposing walls and everything that, that that's that's great um now if anybody ever realized too communicore is one of the very few buildings in any Walt Disney World uh, theme park where guests can walk a full 360 degrees around the buildings. There's a little portion up north that maybe you can't get around, but that presents a a logistical problem of how do you get materials to and from for the restaurants and the stores and and everything. So, yeah, they turn to the Magic Kingdom, and we all know what the Magic Kingdom done. So that portion of Epcot is indeed built on uh, the second floor, and, um, and we could see that today there's there's a um, entry. If you go into Google Maps, you can look at the entry that's behind Universe of Energy, and that's where everything goes goes down. Uh, and there's an outer the outer ring that we were talking about, the outer walkway on that was on the very edge when it opened, um, that was mirrored downstairs, and that's where the um, the walkways were. So it was kind of like a um, it didn't actually form a complete ring. It was kind of more of like an upside down U if you're looking at with the north on the top. All right, now Brian, you'll like this. We're going to go into what Communicore is not, right? And in the in the honorary uh, honoring Danny K, Danny what K. Epcot, yeah, what Epcot <laughs> isn't. Uh, we're going to all the things that didn't make it into Communicore, uh, and I got to I got to flip the page here to some of these. So these this is where you guys are going to see things that really really made themselves into other attractions, uh, you know, in in the parks. Um, so we had the Epcot Creative Center, which was going to be different ideas from students coming in. Now, how about this one, Hal? You'll like this. The audio adventure maze. Okay. Oh. Test the acuity of your sense of sound as we journey through an imaginary landscape, avoiding dangers and securing rewards with only audio cues to guide us. Does that not sound like studios we, with yeah. the, mm-hmm. the monster sound room and all that? Yep. Um, we also had the electronic playground. I think we can safely say that's what made its way up to ImageWorks. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a couple of other interesting ones that, that actually remind me of things that went to interventions. We had the Road to Utopia, which was some sort of game board of um, city planning, and you would design a utopian society and get a computer-printed certificate at the end. <laughs> <laughs> or again, computers were big, and we're going to talk about them shortly. Um, there were, there were, in interventions, there was a house of the future you could walk through, and it was all technology today. Did anybody ever go through that with the insulation and, and the smart home, welcome home, Marty type thing? Do you, do you remember that? Welcome home, Marty. Hey, hey, hey. Dad's home. Right. home. Dad's home. Lord of the manor. Hello, hello. King of the castle. Hello. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here's a Home, home Styles 2000, a digital home and good living. I mean, you know, good ideas don't go away. Um, and a space exhibit uh, where actually you would be able to uh, land the shuttle, which was obviously very, very big at the time for the space program in, in the U.S. So we know that became, you know, space is, we've always talked about space has been something um, that, that was always on the horizon for, for Epcot. And uh, it, was, it was certainly set for here as well. So, so one more uh, item that didn't make it into um into Communicore, but maybe we're seeing it now with the the Magic Kingdom is the uh, is the Tron Arcade. So you never know. Most disappointing thing ever was walking by there and seeing that big sign saying "Coming soon, Tron Arcade," and then it never <laughs> happened. Well, maybe that space just sat sat empty for so long. Where was it going to go? What 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 area was it in? So that would have been in East, so the southeast part of Communicore East, where the Expo Robotics ended up going. For a while. Oh, Communicore. Okay. Before it moved over to West where Club Cool is. Actually, that's the spot. Oh, that's Club the spot. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so Communicore West. Club Cool is, say. Okay. is that West? Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 I know. We we should have... Uh, when we are talking about Communicore East, so you have to understand that when you enter Epcot, you are entering to the south. So Communicore East is on your left and Communicore West is on your right. So that's... Yeah. You got to flip, flip that's your right. mind around. I was... I was flip. I flipped north and south, and I thought I had to flip east and west too. But no, I feel like east actually is east and west is west. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Santa's bringing you a compass this year, just you know, so you got that for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so I don't know. Who knows how? Maybe they'll take 
this queue. You got the Tron coaster coming to the Magic Kingdom. You got an arcade already there that might need a little. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right next to Space yeah. Mountain there. So you. Yeah, need... they said they were going to make all original new games for that for that space. So it was going to be something completely different. So look at that. Old ideas yeah. never die. Mm -hmm. They just rest away for a while. Yeah, they just end up costing right. a lot more money later on. That's right. Do. If they'd only done Western <laughs> River expansion back then. Right. <laughs> Problems any... that wouldn't have to change the pirates today. That's right. You have any idea sure. how expensive it is? Enough about what Communicore isn't. We need to talk about what it was. All right. So how we're going to talk, we're going to take a, a virtual walk through here. And I, I think it would be best just to start up on the north side, um, you know, northeast corridor which was Computer Central. Now, my, my first visit was in 86, and this area, you know, went through some changes over the years. Um, so I, th I figured we could kick it off maybe talking about the Astuter Computer Review. Yeah, Sounds good great. To me. Sounds good? So the Astuter Computer Review was a really... Uh, will, a, a multi will your report on the Astuter Computer Review be as long or longer than the show actually ran in Epcot? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good so brian that's a perfect it is officially has the tag of being epcot's shortest running attraction ever um it it, it uh, only ran for for about two years a little over two years and it was the first attraction to be removed from epcot too so uh and i think after we describe it um you, you might understand why i think to understand again you got to put you in a mindset that computers were new right you did they, they weren't something that you heard of or that you had in your home and you didn't you probably didn't even know what one looked like in in 1980 um you know, or in 1982 so they decide to put together this informational uh production which was a multimedia production with film and then we'll talk about the the grand finale on the and they use pepper's ghost which we'll talk about so here's how it starts off is that um we see stage actor ken jennings um, over at the UK Pavilion. Now, Ken Jennings was known for his role of uh, Tobias Rag in, in Broadway's Sweeney Todd. Uh, actually, also, too, do you know who he played alongside? I'm doing the research here. I didn't realize that. Another a voice actress for, for Disney was... Do you know who it was? No, Todd. No. In, in Sweeney Todd? In Sweeney Todd, yeah. Hmm. For, for two years. Yeah, and, and this was the opening cast, you know. Uh, it was Angela Lansbury, actually. She, she, uh, oh, she played oh, Nellie wow. Lovett. So they walked alongside each other. So we start the film off, and he's at the UK Pavilion, dressed in an all-white suit, and he's singing with a monkey. Now remember, <laughs> this is about computers, <laughs> and I don't know. So somehow via a Star Trek fashion of, of, of beaming, he is beamed to the room we're in. Now, this is all done via Pepper's Ghost, which if you're familiar with Haunted Mansion, if you're familiar with... Um, um, a lot of the other uh, they did used it in horizons and a handful of other different attractions where using a piece of glass and a projection on something below you you can make it look like they're in the room so they use this so that ken jennings character which was do we remember his name early the pearly early the pearly dressed in all white with a top hat Again, we're learning about computers, folks. There's nothing nothing says this more than Should we explain what a pearly is? Yeah, yeah why don't you go ahead and what no. early the pearly means? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So if you think back to Mary Poppins, because maybe this is a touch so remember when they go into the chalk drawing and they sing super califragilistic mm -hmm. And there's the band that has on the like the black coats with like the little dots all over them? Uh, so in that f fashion of, of English entertainment, they would actually take little pieces of pearl, like these pearl dots and sew it into their suits and they were called pearly bands. So if you think of like how mariachis have a traditional costume that they mm -hmm. wear when they play mariachi, this is a traditional costume that you would play when you do this kind of English dance hall style of music. And pearlies always teach you about electronics and, yes. and, and and there was actually a pearly band at the Magic Kingdom, like in the 1970s. That was part of the entertainment there for a ah. while. And I think they might have been at Epcot for, for a little bit, too. Inter there we go. There we go. Early comes out. He explains how the computers work. He walks across the computers. And this is where it gets, this is the go down. We call this the grand finale. The, the, the curtain or the scrim goes up. And behind it, we see the computers uh, that are running 
Epcot. And these were all centralized that the idea back then was that we could run the entire theme park when from one central location. And we'll bury all the cables underground, and, and this would be great. So they're showing you as the scrim is coming up. You're seeing all the computers. And I think, um, Brian, you mentioned it on a um, previous episode recently that, that we the best view of this entire area was in the movie Daryl. Yeah. They, uh, there's a scene where they move through the computer. It's filmed at Epcot. Um, <clears throat> and the clip is on YouTube. I think we included it in our show notes last month when we talked about it. But uh, it's worth mentioning again that they there's a scene where they walk through. It's about a minute long, and uh, it's on YouTube. It actually says Epcot Computer Room, Daryl. So it's very easy to find, and you yep. can see what the they, they they had the data platters back then. Yeah, uh, the I, reel to reel, and yeah, all the hard just platters. And, you know, I, I think that's a testament to, to Hollywood wanting to get it right. And what what's cheaper? Going to a place that had the latest technology, which is that's what this was in 1982. Um, or reproducing things out of cardboard with, you know, fake blinking lights. <laughs> <laughs> he actually shows up sort of like Bert in Mary Poppins in different roles. So he shows up like as a bus driver and a oh. lighting technician and a firefighter and a hotel receptionist through the thing as he talks about the computers and how they play help play the different roles yes. within Epcot Center. Well, and the, be- the beginning and end, I don't know if you mentioned it with, when you were talking about the monkey, but he starts and ends in the Rose and Crown <laughs> pub. Uh, that's right i forgot yes. they, they, mm-hmm. yeah so they send him back to the pub uh, do you know how how else he reminds me of uh, remember the guy uh from the psas the guy in the white top hat that ran around with the cane and and the the the, the, the orange making the orange pops what was he brian oh, oh. time for timer time for timer that's it you know a hanker for a hunk of a slabber slice a chunk of a sniker d is a winner and yet won't spoil my dinner a hanker for a hunk of cheese Yahoo! The same he's kind of like a, a kind of like a cross between him and then is it Alex from uh, Clockwork Orange? <laughs> That's right. Huh. A little Willy Wonka thrown in. I mean, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's all good. It's all good. It's, it's all, all good. good. And, and if we haven't mentioned it yet, the song and dance number in the Astuter Computer Review. Why don't you tell us about it, Brian? You, well, that, that's all I'm going to tell you is there's a big song and dance there's number. There's a big number. And it is written by... The, the Sherman Brothers. The Sherman Brothers. Yeah. Now, not one of their... Well, I guess it's memorable because I grew up with it on on the Epcot album. Because even into the '80s, the official Epcot uh, official album still had this song on there, uh, and it's forever ingrained in my head. But why don't we why don't we take a listen to Early the Pearly singing a little bit of the Astuter Computer? You see, my friends, the computer makes life easier, <laughs> saves me time and headaches too. <laughs> he sorts things out, analyzes in a shake. My enormous problem to him's a piece of cake. He's got a great big memory like an elephant. I haven't been able to find any footage of the Astuto Computer Review. However, there is footage of Early the Pearly performing this number outside of Communicore. A bunch of people in skin tight silver suits waving banners and spinning them and big exclamations. And I, I think uh, even the CEO of Sperry Univac at the time. So it's the dedication to that. So. As you can imagine, monkeys, white suits, and top hats generally don't <laughs> explain how computers work very well. So uh, it closed on January 2nd, 1984. And as we said, it was the first attraction to be removed from Epcot. And it, re- it get this, guys, it reopened only February 4th of the same year. So 32 days, they were able to throw it out, redo it. And really, if we think about it, it's really just filming new things. It wasn't a lot yeah. to change. I'm uh, sure they had started filming the new thing before they closed. Oh, yeah. For me, computer, everybody needs a friend. No need to stand, no need to stand. Ken is given the boot. Um, he's sent back to the pub, as we mentioned. He's forever in England. And we get Julie. And I don't... I. I don't know who exactly she was, but she has a sidekick. Does anybody remember her sidekick? No. Oh, it's that. <clears throat> is it Io? Io, that, yes, yeah. yes. The slightly glowing orange blob with a face, <laughs> with a, with a smile, I should say. With a, with so a his cousin, also named Io, was in uh, was in the World Key Information System. So oh. If, so there's probably a connection there, although the characters looked a little different. Yeah. So Julie is now 
replaced Ken and or early of the pearly, I should say. And uh, she goes through all the different computers. Just last time we used Pepper's Ghost again. Uh, and there's a couple neat additions to it. Um, first of all, how you love this, we get a Pepper's Ghost demonstration of how auto animatronics work. And tell them who who was the coolest, I mean, the most perfect guy you could put out there for it. It, it was Mr. Eggs. That's right. Mr. Eggs from Kitchen Cabaret. <laughs> so they had a secondary one that was underneath you and Pepper's Ghost would make it appear. Um, and I, I remember watching this and, and seeing him in the center. And Julie would walk across the top of the computers. I found there's an, somebody videotaped the entire show from start to finish, and it's out there on YouTube. So it's a very, very, very rare piece, which is which is really cool. Um, she mentions all the different other systems. So if you're a computer geek and you remember things like this, a Deck Vax 11, you remember those? <laughs> I remember in my first couple of years of college, we used to email from Vaxes. They had three of those mm. playing video discs for the world key that you just mentioned. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. They had 24. I'm going to assume a bin loop is an audio loop for the areas and tractions. What is a bin loop? So so the bin loops are, um, those could be used for audio, but they could also be used for, um, so those could be tape, and they could also be 35 millimeter film or 16 millimeter film. Basically, a bin loop, if you picture mm-hmm. like two reels of uh Well, you know how on a typical reel, it's like the film would be very tight between the two reels. You'd keep the tension there. In the bin loop, the film or the audio tape literally just spills out (laughs) like in a glass case. So it stays loose. uh, So that way there's it's not under tension. And so the take up spool, you know, will pulls it very slowly. But there's kind of this like overflow. And that's the. That's the bin part of it. And then it is looped, as they say, so that way you can play the show continuously without rewinding it. Our audio expert always pulls through on these. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we, we had that. And that was for all area audio and attractions from one central location. They had Max, SCUS, ECS, which these are all their acronyms for the different control systems that they had uh, for microvax computers, because if the three times a refrigerator wasn't enough you could get the size of four microwaves and a mini vex um and uh that was all there now do you guys remember at one point she talks about how the computers control attractions and you're looking at these computers you're looking at the console and then what happens above who how tell us what happens above because it was a glorious it is glorious and we got to talk about it because it might still be there so above the center part of this this area, and I can't remember if we're seeing a. I think we're seeing a reflection of it in the glass. Yeah, I'm not sure was, if it was a Pepper's yeah. Ghost or or if it was actually mm-hmm. there. Was a scale model of Epcot Center with horizons, mm-hmm. uh, and all the world chase the world showcase pavilions like at the time, uh, so they could light up different areas and show you how the communication, you know, how the. Uh, like it was everything was wired so you could see you know lines tracing like the fire control systems and all those things so they would talk about horizons and oh light would come on horizons and the little fiber yeah. optics would light up and you know as a kid you're just looking up there going that is the coolest model railroad i want that <laughs> so yeah now there is rumor that it is still up there and and we were able to and, and there's hardly any photos there's hardly any video of anything so we have some great news for our listeners. You've got to go to the show notes and check this out. So go to RetroWDW.com and click on the article for episode 38. We have spoken to somebody who in 2006, as a cast member, was able to go up there. And we have a photograph of the underneath of that model showing all the fiber optics and wires and everything. Better yet, we have the photograph looking at the model from up top. And... It's cruder than I thought, but it's still yeah. really, really cool. <laughs> so, um. so there is one other photo out there. So Tom K. Morris, uh, former Imagineer, did tweet out a picture of uh, the Imagineering staff that worked on that show, like working on the model, the, yeah. or maybe the model makers, like cool. like standing in the middle of uh, like 
the lagoon <laughs> like poking out of it i think there's an access hatch in the center so they gotcha. they're poking their heads out of that and it's very that's so cool it's very funny that's so cool but there's nobody coming yeah. through the lagoon that's the cool part of our photos <laughs> that's right that's the difference it's all there so i mean there is rumored to this day that you know uh, obviously when interventions went a lot of things were ripped out as we i think we mentioned in a previous episode how that um some of all thrills is kind of in is where this was uh, so we really don't know what's there we know over time the computers were decentralized it was cheaper it was better you know as everything was shrunk down in size you didn't need the central data systems running certain things from in the park where the attraction was happening was it was a better deal so that area i'm sure the underground has been you know since uh, a lot of things have been removed i'm sure they're not running bin loops anymore so uh um, no, that's all gone digital yeah. over the years. And the queue for this was great, too, because you had to get up to the next level, which was really cool. I remember the carpeted snake queue and coming back down. It was fantastic. But we kind of came down and we saw, Brian, you tried to locate this guy. We tried to get him. We tried to figure out he spent some time at the Contemporary years ago. Who is he? Oh, you're talking about Smart One. That's the one. That's the right. So Smart One was probably Epcot's most famous robot at the beginning, uh, and probably of all time. Uh, and Smart One was a robot in the center of a little circle where people could stand around and he interacted with you, right? He did, and... and you couldn't interact just by looking at you. You had to pick up a telephone and press a button. Of course. <laughs> so you had to tell him that you were there. So here's the thing that everybody forgets about Smart One. So the the premise was that you would they wanted to show an, a unique way for humans to interact with computers. Now today we take this very much for granted and there's a little thing called a voice response system. So every time you call your credit card company or someone like that and someone says, you know, press or say one to for English, press or say two for Spanish. And you get frustrated because you're yelling yes into the into the phone like eight or nine times in order to step through the menus. <laughs> right. That's what this was. This was a demonstration of one of the very first voice response units. And the way it worked is you would push the button, as Todd said, you would pick up a phone handset and then uh, he would turn towards you. He would actually turn and look at you and kind of make robotic eye contact. And then there were <laughs> three games that you could play. You could He could try to guess your birthday. You could pick your favorite animal. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the third one was now. So Trivia. Trivia. Okay. So uh, Global Thermonuclear War was one of the options. <laughs> would you choose it's a, a good game, uh, Chef? All he could understand is yes and no. So, if you when you did the the, the um, your birth month game or your favorite animal game, it's like you would basically pick one of the. There was a board with those little piezoelectric uh, letters on top. Mm -hmm. So he would show you uh, twelve things to choose from. So if you picked snake as one of the options for the what your favorite animal was, he would then flip. Uh, a series of um, of the names off of the board and he would say is your favorite animal on this board and you would respond yes or no he would understand that and then he would come up with a different series of animals and ask you again if it was on there say yes or no and i don't know if it went through two rounds or three rounds but by the end of the third round by showing and hiding different combinations he would be able to guess what your animal was and then he would tell you oh you picked snake so it was basically a digital system that was there to take your voice input and then be able to give you a voice output. Uh, and, and that's what he was. He was actually a, a really early version of that. How quickly did he did he he swung around? I mean, there was about seven or eight kiosks or, or phones that you could dial in from. He would just move to one and then the next and then he kind of spun around yeah. in the mm -hmm. 360, right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Do, do you guys know how Smart One got all of his knowledge, though? Uh, no. Oh, uh, yeah, see how knows. There's a joke. He went to solid state. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> oh, For God. those young viewers and you don't, or young listeners, and you don't know the joke. So, back oh. in the 50s and 60s, there was something called vacuum tubes, which were filled with uh, vacuum, as it sounds. All the air was pumped out, and they were the first 
type of electronics, uh, they got eventually replaced by the transistor and the integrated circuit. And uh, on in technology in the 70s and 80s, because it didn't have this vacuum tube, which was glass and they were really cool because they would glow and stuff. Uh, but to tout the fact that it had transistors and integrated circuits in it, uh, they would print on it very often solid state, meaning that there was no vacuum, there were no tubes, there was no glass, anything. It was solid electronics. So, uh, and then hence state as a school. So, wah, 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 wah. I, I will never forget our my the first stereo that we had had solid state. Oh, yeah. Oh, like did it? Really big letter. Lots yeah. of electronics in the yeah. 70s and early 80s said solid state on there. It's... Yeah. Make sure you weren't getting those tubes because. Now, kids, remember, if the tube blew out, you had to go to the store and find the right tube and replace it. Right. But if you had a solid state and anything blew out, you just threw the TV. <laughs> you threw the device out. So, and yes, your phones are solid state that you carry around. Well, and so. computers have gone that way, too, because we had Absolutely. The, the hard drives that are all now chip oh, yeah. drive, flash, flash drives drive based, now. Yeah. So. Yeah. They're called SSDs. Yeah. Solid state drives. There you are. <laughs> so what goes around comes around. Carry it back. All right, so I know this this next one. You know, there's a lot of computers in this area, and with a lot of different games you could play, uh, and a lot of them were touchscreen. For the very first time, you could touch a screen, and you know this is pre drive up ATMs and all that stuff. So any type of thing that you could do without pressing a physical button was amazing to 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 everybody. Um, so my favorite that I know I spent many many uh, hours and minutes on was compute a coaster. How? What about you? Did I mean it was so cool. That was the coolest thing ever, <laughs> and and just the lucite display with the red light following the co the coaster pattern around. Yep. I mean that display on its own was huge. <laughs> yeah. So just one second. Let's. I just want to describe where this is. Yeah, yeah. In do. relation to things today. So when you go to guest relations and at Epcot and go to walk in, that's exactly where this computer coaster and smart one would be. Literally right when you walk in the door of what guest relations is, that things were configured differently. It used to be a solid glass wall, but that's the area that we're talking about. So what was Computer Coaster? Well, we had a friend on this touch screen that would help us through it. JT, any guess at what kind of animal would em you would employ to help you build a roller coaster? Do you have any idea? Um, a snake. <laughs> a snake? Well, that's, that's a good guess, because he, you know, he can't... Yeah. How, about a, well, how about a dumb beaver? Uh, it was. It was a beaver with a lisp. <laughs> <laughs> so now was it a wooden roller coaster it's pseudo wooden uh, actually yes it was it, yes it, it was a wooden roller coaster it had, it had a loop but it was it was yeah so what you could do is what what would happen is they would present you um, a number of different combinations of corkscrews loops camelbacks different types of things that you would experience in a uh, in, on a roller coaster, and you would essentially tell the computer what order you wanted to put them in. It was limited uh, in that... I think you had maybe, what, five or six yeah, choices? Yeah, and you could have three or four spots to fill. It was basically making a, an, an oval. Uh, and, of course, the beaver would get a little bit uh, up, upset at you and, and, and get be concerned when you created something that, you know, would you know the, the track didn't match up and people would fly right. off. When you completed something that was acceptable to his... Uh, uh, to, to his, you know, to him, he would let you ride it, and it would zoom into this this first person view on the coaster, and it would pull you up, and then you would ride on your creation. And what's great is that we have a couple animated uh, gifs of that we did of this, and and, and um, we also have some footage in one of our Epcot films where where uh, very good footage was was filmed of of this. But it was just dumbfounding for the time that I could touch the screen and then. The allure of first person, anything was was huge back then. Yeah. <clears throat> so for those of you who are wondering, like, how could this be done in real time in 3D? It wasn't. This was a laser disc driven mm -hmm. game. Uh, so you would ba the beaver would come on, and it, he wasn't even animated. He was basically a still picture, and the camera would just kind of zoom in as he would talk. And he had a his accent was very much like the gopher in uh, Winnie the Pooh. Yes. <laughs> so he had a little bit of this in his voice. <laughs> They'd say things like, Shay, that looks swell. I suppose you'll be wanting this now. So, yeah, he had 
little bit of that voice. Um, but yeah, it was. Now I see a picture of Todd doing this. I think we have it on the site, right? You we do. Yes. Uh, and where I'm looking at, like I see the the wireframe sections of the coaster. When did the beaver appear? And was the beaver wireframe like no, that? He, or? No, it was like an almost like an animated uh, still, if you will, like a one yeah, he one was, cell. It was a it was a full painting. Just yeah. I think maybe one or two poses, maybe just on a background, yeah. like painted it inside his workshop with some pictures of like roller coasters in the background. Gotcha. That J- JT, you brought up the photo. Look at the size of the box I'm holding on to. Oh yeah. It's a big guy. That thing's like 20 some. Uh, well, actually look at the one. My, my brother's on the one on the back left. That thing is at least 24 inches deep. You could put your brother mm-hmm. in the box. Yeah, exactly. And this, guys, when we're talking about a box, you'll have to see the, well, again, we'll include the pictures in yeah. the show notes. But this is how's the CRT, the computer, who knows what else in there. The beaver. Yeah, so these are CRT monitors. Yeah. yeah. These are true television sets as we know it. Uh, but I think there was about seven or eight kiosks all around. And again, the touchscreen. And, and you're going to hear the term touchscreen as we go through the rest of these different things as well. Um, all right. So, so we've built a coaster. We understand how computers work. We're going to go through a lot of computers here because we've got uh, a couple to come up with it to, to go over here. But the Great American Census, I'm just going to read what Birnbaum says because I think he says it's it's best here. Uh, and again, put your mindset in 1986 here. It's difficult to say which aspect of this attraction is more compelling, the chance to use those amazing touch-sensitive TV screens or the facts that are revealed about this nation in the course of the computer's guessing games. And what happens is you get a, um, a list of topics uh, and you choose one that you really want to be questioned on. Um, yeah, it was like a, a little quiz thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you, you know, Birnbaum goes on to say that all the sorts of interesting facts come up, that the women in, women in, the, 19, in the 1800s have an average of seven children, or the citizens of Alaska have a higher <laughs> average income than those in any other state. I'm sure, this is all outdated uh, facts. But um, it's funny. It says, every time someone answers a question incorrectly, and a monoxious sounding buzzer goes off, poking embarrassing titters from the from the erring players and a good deal of warm-hearted sympathy from lookers on. Sounds like something that uh, Rick Steves would write on his travel log. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, more touchscreen. Um, now, the part of, now, the part of that thing that I actually thought was that was interesting was above it. So above the monitors as part of the display, mm-hmm. there was sort of this contraption with little people with wheels for feet that went around in a circle and there was a counter on top of it with like oh like 10 digits and sort of like a a a a sort of a spinner or a knob at the end and when the little wooden guys would go past the end they would hit this counter the spinner part with their hands and it would increase the digit by one Mm -hmm. to show like the population going up so these things would be in a continual thing going around and like making this counter like count up as new people were added to like to the population of the United States. And that can mean we're only in one area of communicory. Do you remember the name? Oh, uh, no. The American <laughs> Express travel port. This area had, again, touch sensitive video screens, right? You, you guys are getting the thing here. Um, now, this was an area about as, as how pointed out. They had this that awesome population counter, which which coincided with the great American census. Also in the travel port, there was a 14-foot sphere, and it had destinations projected from the from within. Now, here's an interesting fact I found out. The guy who designed that, again, I don't know how you get credit for designing a sphere, but let's just <laughs> put that on hold for a moment. I don't have his, have his name, but it was the same individual that designed the Lucite fountain in the front of Epcot. So oh, that, that whole sculpture... Yeah, the one that that fountain, the one that we made the replica of. So yeah, maybe we'll make a giant sphere next time. So what was special about this sphere? Um, it had destinations projected from within. And rumor has it, and how, let me know if you ever knew about this, but rumor has it that there, were, there was a Caribbean scene that would pop up as one of the destinations, and two of the women were topless in it. It was never caught. Oh, I, hmm. So. I have no idea. <laughs> so. That. <laughs> that thing was always the least interesting thing. It, it was. was basically just this giant ball, red ball, and it would show like s- slides, <laughs> like through, like she said, it would 
through the inside, sort of on the outside of the ball, and it was right. not particularly fascinating. Brian, Brian, do you have that set up in your new slide carousel? Are you projecting <laughs> them on a large sphere in your living room? Not yet, but okay. You know, if we it's can dream way. it, we can do it. <laughs> yeah, but you could you could go book travel there because they yeah. had American Express agents right. that would actually really for real book travel for you. That's right. They had they had agents there that would you could book stuff at a service desk. Um, and they also had what they called vacation stations. These were video disc, laser disc, touch screens, and you could tour the world. And you could, there was this very, very crude map uh, of the different continents. And you'd press Australia, and then you'd zoom in and press something else. And you would see a video played, uh, you know, about, about that area. And then you could go over and book your vacation if you choose. Um, who of you guys went down there? I, I'll admit this. I remember as a kid... I, my, I asked my grandparents to take me to the bank. I bought traveler's checks. Absolutely. <laughs> and purchased my souvenirs with traveler's checks. You did the same, Brian. Well, I remember getting traveler's checks as a gift before we went on our trip. Prior to um, the proliferation of debit cards and, and uh, you know, ATMs in general, uh, people, that's how you travel. And, right. And for those of you who are young enough that you don't know what they were, uh, basically they looked they were about the size of a dollar bill and uh, they were issued mostly by American Express, but you could get them from other places. But American Express was the most common place to get them. Uh, and you would go to the bank uh, with $50 and they would give you a $50 American Express traveler's check. What you were supposed to do was write down the serial number, which wasn't like two, 200 letters or anything like that. I mean, it was something manageable. Uh, or in later years, photocopy them and keep those in a safe place so that if you were burgled uh, while you were on tour <laughs> somewhere, which was a significant problem around the world back then, you would have a recourse because before everybody just carried cash. So credit cards weren't really ex accepted a lot of places. So everybody carried cash and you'd convert the cash into the currency of whatever country you were in. And thieves targeted tourists to steal their bags and break into their hotel rooms and rob them on the street and you would lose all of your money. So uh, American Express and other banks came up with these traveler's checks where if that happened to you, uh, all you would do is call the American Express hotline and tell them my traveler's checks were stolen. Here's the serial numbers. Uh, and they would issue you replacements so that you wouldn't be destitute in the middle of Athens, Greece or uh, Cairo, Egypt or something like that. Or in Main Street, USA, you just go to the Sun Bank right, right down there in Town Square and say, hey, uh, I need to do some banking here. Uh, I was burgled by Mr. Walrus out there on the street. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they'd set you up. McFarkle right. yeah, burgled right. me. That's right. And, and you remember the receipts you would get, right? The copies of them. Right. Well, there so were stubs. Cool. There were stubs, too. Like the stubs, that's right. Order, yeah. Something like that. Uh, and you can still buy American Express traveler's checks. So if somebody wants if to you... go retro on a trip, uh, yeah. they are being accepted by fewer places. But I'm pretty sure Disney still lists that as an acceptable form of currency. In fact, I want I want to see a tweet. I want to see a photo. Send us your photo of you using your traveler's checks to purchase something. I want to, I want to see. I that. I'd say the, ne the next event, if yes. you know somebody doesn't have a ticket, we'll let them in if they have a valid traveler's check. That's <laughs> awesome. They just write it right out yeah. to us. We'll take it. We'll take it. So don't carry cash. Carry American Express traveler's checks. Don't leave home without them. Did we mention why American Express had something in Communicore? No, that's but. So, they, yeah, we should have said the travel port was sponsored by American Express. Go, go ahead, Howe. Explain that. Well, and that's because they sponsored the American Adventure. They were a co-sponsor of American and, Adventure with who, How Right. Coke. Coca-Cola. Uh, Coca-Cola. And they were also the official, like, credit card of Walt yes. Disney World for many, many White years. White glove treatment. Um, so, yeah, how there's, there's a couple other games there. We had the Get Set Jet game. Now, I don't remember playing this one, but... Just the requirements in, in looking at in here that I have to complete the check-in, maintenance, and boarding and luggage of passengers on the plane within 60 seconds. I can't even you can't yes. even get one person to their seat in 60 seconds. This was a very frustrating game. So basically the layout of the screen was there was an airplane in the middle and it had a ramp on the top. So if you picture sort of like a 
faked side perspective. There was a mm-hmm. ramp at the top and there were people that would move from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. And then at the bottom was luggage that would move from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. So as a person went by the ramp, you would have to touch them in order to make them board the plane. And then when the <laughs> luggage came across the bottom, you'd have to like push the luggage in order to get it. And I I can't remember now if there were certain colors. If it's like you had to get like a purple person with the purple baggage going at the same time. And then I think, like you said, there were some safety checks that you have to do. Yeah. So you have to click on some different parts of the plane. It was a very, very frustrating <laughs> game. And I don't know if I ever actually ever completed it. And, and that's probably why I don't remember. I probably just moved right on over to <laughs> the Manufactory, which we have right. a t-shirt for. This was, we do. This is not one that, I mean, we should make a computer coaster t-shirt, but the Fly Game. Absolutely. The Fly Game, as they call it in Birnbaum, it's really funny. He didn't have the right names in half of these, which is pretty funny. But it was called <laughs> the Manufactory, uh, where you, you is designed, this is interesting, to illustrate the role of computers in manufacturing, which, uh, which yeah. is really... It, it, you know, we're not talking about the robots yet in Robot Expo, which we'll talk about on an eventual Communicore West episode. But um, yeah, explain how this one worked because this was kind of neat and, and patriotic. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so the idea of this game was that you'd have to put together three American flags properly in the, in the correct amount of time. So basically, if you picture sort of a center channel, it's like... Um, it's almost like kind of Tetris in a way, mm. except it goes from the bottom to the top instead of the way. So, uh, so you'd have pieces of the flag would come out. You'd get like a like a white rectangle, and then on the right side of the screen, you'd have stars and stripes and the blue field. And as this like the slab of the flag came up and popped into place, you'd have to quickly touch like the different uh, elements of the flag and put it on the flag before it left the the, uh, the little slot so um, it was sort of a game of nerves that you could quickly do <laughs> and then uh, if you managed to do it three times it's like it would play this very sort of electronic sounding version of uh, the stars and stripes forever and I think there were some fireworks too <laughs> yeah it's as if that they have peppy patriotic music that celebrates yeah. their success it was just like da, 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 da. <laughs> Birnbaum claims it was hard to resist another go round was mm. it like MIDI music know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah pretty, it was. Pretty, it was pretty much. It was very much like that. Your Atari eight, eight uh, four bit or even sure, sure. Music. Yes, and, and you know the thing I we should I forgot to mention when we we're talking about computer coaster. The whole reason that that was there is because we we're trying. They were trying to give an idea of computer aided design, right? Which was a brand new, and thing. it was one of the first CAD uh, displays of CAD that probably anybody ever saw. You know, a CAD yep. was not a, a common household term as it is now. Now. We did an episode, a couple, man, I don't even remember what it was, but on the Universe of Energy. And the entire attraction of University of Energy wasn't enough for Exxon. They wanted to go further. And at the end of the ride, they asked you to visit the Energy Exchange in Communicore East, which was at the very northeast corner of Communicore East. There was a lot to do. And this was a pretty big area, too. Um, so this was all sponsored by Ex- Exxon. And it had different areas where you would explore biomass, synthetic fuels, solar, wind, nuclear, mechanical, you know, you, fossil fuels, you name it. These are all different areas to, to tell you about how we get energy in our lives. And the exhibits were really, really done well. I mean, from I remember the giant piece of oil shale, right, just sitting yeah. there that you'd walk up and touch, which, which, which was so cool. And the huge drilling platform model what did that thing stand 15 feet tall it was huge it was massive oh let's see so there's a picture i'm looking at and it's basically going floor to ceiling almost yeah yeah it it, it was it was really really big but let, let's let's we have a couple pictures of of myself and and, and everybody uh of my family participating in some of the the items there um, but you, you had the bicycle generator, which was, which was really cool. So this was something to demonstrate how physical energy, you know, could be converted into electricity. So you would bike, uh, and the faster you would pedal, the more energy it would create. I think there, there may have even been some hand crank things like, like they have in, in museums yeah. and stuff. Um, I remember not being very good at the bike. No, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't sustain it for very long. So you were trying on the bike, you were trying to compare the amount that you generated uh, compared to the amount of power in a in one gas in one gallon of gasoline, 
Mm. So um, they said even pedaling at top speed, human beings come in a poor second, uh, which is pretty neat. So, yeah, they had the turning crank, um, how long it would take you to generate uh, $1 worth of electricity. And I think now today at today's electricity rates, you might be standing there a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they came down. I don't know. Huh. Um but they had all different types of programs discussing hydropower, geothermal, more touch screens, um, you know, providing. Do you remember Do you remember the game where you had to get the quarterback from the hotel to the stadium, like no. with a taxi? So you have, a, you have a photo in the gallery. And part of the thing was they would give you some tips about like um, if you were on the highway, you would want to roll up your windows because the drag coefficient would be higher and you would use more gas. But there was this game that you're basically trying to get a, the premise was that you were going to lead a quarterback from a hotel room to the stadium in time for the big game. <laughs> and you would use the touch screen to say which direction on this sort of like overhead view of the roadway. Mm -hmm that it would take and that was that was another one as i i have probably played that you know dozens of times over the course of visiting epcot and i think i won it once <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't easy it was not easy oh man so there was let's see what we all that the coal mining displays um you know all sorts of uh, oil and uh i mean it really it I, encompassed what, what Universe of Energy talked about and really gave yeah. you the physical hands-on experience of everything that they talked about in that attraction. Did it, it, did it discuss brain power? The, the one, the one <laughs> form of energy that we never, never run out of. <laughs> no, but oil shale really was the, was the highlight. <laughs> I want to say I read that that piece of oil share, shale weighed like 10,000 pounds or something. Really? Like, I don't know how they got it out of there when they <laughs> decided to close There's it. the question. There's pieces Somebody of it still know. available. Yeah, I mean it. It's it, there's a there's a picture on our gallery, and if we have, like I said, we're gonna link to this gallery because there's a there's about fifty sixty great photos, and and this woman in a, God, she's in a like an all yellow jumpsuit. That's that's not a very good looking outfit, but anyway, um, she's probably standing five something, and and it's way over the head. You can't even see the top, and that's a, that's a you're right. It's a big big piece of rock. It's a big. Yeah. There was one other thing in there that I recall. So during this point of time, we had the Exxon Valdez spell, Valdez spill, oh, uh, yeah. where the oil was spilled all over. Exxon had a large tanker, and I don't remember. Yeah, the ca or cap something Captain happened. Hazelwood yeah. was a little deep into the uh, demon rum that night and ran, <laughs> ran aground. And there was a terrible oil spill, and the coastline was ruined, and all these animals were covered with oil, and Exxon was quite unpopular because of that. And in this area, they actually had uh, they had some places where you could sit down with a touch screen and take sort of like a public opinion poll quizzes. Mm -hmm. And one of one of the thing was like, oh, how do you view Exxon as a company? And then they would show you the results of it. And I can tell you before and after that oil spill, the results of how people felt about Exxon were like much, much worse. Like <laughs> after the oil spill, it's like you'd go and say, like, I hate you. So. That's funny. If you look at this gallery, this just reminds me of like a science museum field trip. That's all. It yeah. And then the computers, yeah. like yep. I'm looking at this game. We have a picture of the one how I was just talking with the quarterback. It looks like our first computer, like a Tandy from the mid 80s. Like, it's, oh, yeah. it's just horrible, but you loved it. So you you you, you did love it. And, and you're you're exactly right that it, 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 it had this scientific yet World's Fair promise of hope it, it was just neat neat stuff that you hadn't seen before and you know we'll talk about the demise of it in a little bit and, and what eventually happened but you know there was so much new stuff uh, the one thing i wanted to point out in the energy exchange too is all the kinetic sculptures that were in there were cool yeah. too yeah. they were all turning and and they, some of them i think were linked by pulleys and all it was just it you're right you're, you're exactly right jt is that that had this scientific feel to it in this this museum and it was such a display with neon and all sorts of cool stuff now there's one real interesting piece here in, in our gallery i wanted to read you guys because tonight we've talked a lot about touch screens and we we joke that oh yeah it was new back then but i think this might have come from you brian and i saved this because it was the back side of a postcard uh, postmarked Lakeland, Florida, uh, 25 cent stamp. So as per the date, this gives us, it looks like August, 1990. So this is you know eight years removed from when Epcot opened. Um, 
So Mr. and Mrs. Locke of Baltimore, Maryland received a postcard from looks like Sherry and somebody else. But uh, Epcot was fascinating. The co their computers operate by pressing pictures on the screen. So 1990, it's still, uh, you know, amazing. They also went fishing and landed a few bass. Is, is that a fishing fish. term when you do you land a fish? I guess so. Yes. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not a. I, I don't. I don't get into fish conversations. So yeah. <laughs> but if you know, if you know Sherry or whoever this is, and Sherry and I'm Ted, Adam, I think it's Ted. Ted, yes, Sherry and Ted out of Baltimore, Maryland. They have a lot of pictures apparently too. But you know, the reason I say that is because we joke all the time and we all forget and we always remind our listeners. But here it is, even eight years after, it's still something that was amazing and probably by the 1990s it was becoming a little more popular but i, I people just really the only time it. i remember seeing touch screens even towards the latter half of the 90s you started to see it in atm machines but, mm -hmm. but beyond that i don't like i don't have a vivid memory of a lot of touch screens until we got into the 2000s really I mean, there were a couple, right? You, did, you know, I remember seeing them on some kiosks, um, you and, know, when purchasing. And back then, stuff. if you remember, half the time they didn't work. You'd push your finger <laughs> on the screen, and something else would light up, and it, you know. Well, you, you you get on Spaceship Earth, and you still see people pushing on the screen with their finger. I mean, we live in a society with touchscreens now, and you see them. And, and I remember seeing people do this That's because tactile a, feel is better, Todd. It, Exactly. You need. You know what it's called? Haptic feedback. Yes. Is what you need. That's why I Haptic use a buckling feedback. spring keyboard at the office. I... That's right. And I have my little vibration on my Android. But anyway, we digress. But um, there's a video of my brother utilizing um something in Communicore West. So we'll talk about it on that episode. And you see his finger go up, and he's pushing it, and he's trying to swipe and trying to swipe, and how, you know, inaccurate it was. Um, because there were all these beams being scanned. It's not like the touchscreens we have today. <laughs> right. It was these beams going left and right and intersecting and trying to figure out where your finger was. But, you know, I remember people physically pushing as hard as they could on the screen thinking that it was going to, you know, make an indentation. So it's just amazing how far we've come. However, let's talk about real buttons that we could press. So let's get out of the screens here. We need to move over to the electronic forum. Now, this had a couple different things, and I, I remember going, I think I went in once in 1986. How I'm sure you, you went in the electronic form more than I did. Oh, sure, yeah. a couple times. So we had a couple things going on in here. Let's let's talk about first the most you know, well-known portion of it, which was the Future Choice Theater. Now, this theater sat 175 people. You would go in, and they would show you a short film on certain current topics. And, you know, they were just basic things that were going on. They weren't trying to be very controversial, but they would just show you a couple different things. Here's, after that film was printed, and here's where it's got unique. Your armrest would have five buttons on it, and they were of the type of a membrane keyboard, membrane button, which is a hard plastic that is over, has a little, uh, a little piece of metal attached into the plastic, and when you press the bubble of the plastic down, it goes down and, and presses and in, in, uh, into a, a target pattern, if you will, that completes the circuit and acts as a button. You've seen these types before on airplanes. If you remember the old air, a lot, some airplanes may even still have oh, it, the yeah, membrane yeah, yeah, buttons. Yeah. And you, you, if you press them long enough and use them enough, the, the plastic cracks and then the whole thing peels off and it's a mess. So anyway. I remember the Atari 400. Yes, that was a membrane keyboard. Yes. yes. No tactile feedback no. at all. You had five different buttons and here's where it would happen. You'd see this film and they would ask some basic demographics of the audience how old is everybody you know where are you from what is your i don't even know if they got into politics political orientation to certain different things um and then they would start asking they would first show you what the demographics are but then they start asking you different topics and you would vote on things like what is your feeling on you know i'm sure the nuclear arms race was big in the 80s you know you know or what's your feeling on, on nuclear arms in general and you would press on your keypad on the right hand side you know a b c d or e and then instantaneously through the magic of computer in an 8-bit 4-bit type of <laughs> how many colors were on the screen maybe five <laughs> six colors maybe how yeah um mm -hmm. bar graphs would be displayed and they would break it out and they'd show you how you can take that data look at it and figure out you're know, looking at the demographics and what you answered that you know the people in on the east coast 
you know, were less popular for this topic and the people on the West Coast were more pro this topic. And it was really, really very unique. Whether or not they kept any of that data, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it all seemed to happen in, in the now and it's more of a demonstration. But how is looking like how is looking like he's he's got something on this? So, yes. So actually, the um, the data was captured by um, that was sponsored, sort of sponsored by time hmm. initially was what they were going to do. But uh, the results of the Epcot polls would show up in USA Today. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, like usually once once a week they would have the results from a from a previous Epcot poll. Who's listening to this? Get on microfiche right now at your local library. <laughs> get us some of these polls. They're probably down in those little cool graphics that USA Today I, does. I believe Michael Crawford has tweeted some awesome. of them in the past. All right, we got to find those. Those are those are cool. We did have another voting poll there. Do you guys, does anybody remember? This is this is, has a funny story with it, too. So I got, I got to tell this. Um, this area had a, a person of the century. Now, this takes us into the 90s, but I think we need to talk about because it didn't make it out very far. So there was this idea that since you're already voting, when you come out, you could go over to these kiosks and you could vote for the person of the century. They had 89 different people that you could vote for or you could write somebody in. And the idea was that on January 1st, 2000, Eisner, in a big celebration, would present who the visitors of Epcot have deemed the person of the century. So they had people on there like, you know, Gandhi and Alan Shepard and JFK and all these, you know, Martin Luther King, etc. Walt Disney, I believe, was one of the ones. What's interesting, in less than a year, everything was gone. Totally gone. No, <laughs> no word on what happened. They just threw everything all out. The story goes that because you could write in things, cast members were starting to go up and writing in names, Bob, Dan, whatever. And these started to become options because you could write people in. And basically it got so skewed and so out of whack. It closed in March 1991, never to be heard of. Nobody was named person of the century, a person of the century. Uh, so it was a very short-lived. So if you ha- if you did put a vote in, I apologize. No way of getting that data back, but uh, possibly Dan, the custodian at Communicore East, uh, might have been. Uh, Mr. Eisner, uh, OJ's winning. What should we do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. so so before the person of the century, that's. Uh, that was the pre-show. So that yes. was a later edition. So yes. at first, we and we've talked about this on other shows. We talked about the... Uh, the World Newsroom. Yes. Why don't you tell so us you a little could, bit what that is, How? So before you before you went in to cast your vote in the Future Choice Theater, you would take a couple of steps down into the, uh, the lovely little area, and there were four kiosks. And those kiosks... You said sunk down. You stepped down. Yes. It's like a mm-hmm. sunken living room. You know, <laughs> out of the 60s and 70s. <laughs> yeah. So there were four kiosks there. Uh, two of them would show, had a bunch of different TVs, and they would show you national news and sports and weather from different places around the country. And you could, you had a little selector, so you could turn on, like, the news from Chicago or some, and that was all brought to you by the magic of satellite telecommunications. Um one kiosk had financial news or special programs, and then the fourth kiosk had Disney news. That's right. So yep. you would sit down there and just sort of watch TV and see some of these things before you went in and made your selections. Now, inside, there was a three-quarter scale model of the Telestar 3 satellite that you would see. Mm. And when you looked out the window on the lawn, there was the real Telestar 3 and a Galaxy satellite receiver dish both sitting there. So you could see a three-quarter scale model of the satellite. And then the dish, the actual dish receiving the data was outside along with the Galaxy receiver uh, receiving it and, and other information. So and, and, you know, those satellite dishes on the lawn of Communicore were a, a, a staple for those for so many years. Yeah, see for a long time. So now my understanding is that this this sunken down part actually st- is part of mouse gear today. So yep. there is still a little bit of it uh, that you can experience. Oh, I'll have to go in there and figure out where that is. So All right. So. We've kind of run through majority of it. There's one more. Or it's actually, there's two more areas I want to talk about. Stargate Restaurant, mm-hmm. which was really cool. Now, what's neat about the Stargate was that there was outside seating, a little bit on the, on the, on the Communicore East side, but the place just reeked of hamburger right? <laughs> and ketchup. I mean, it was your typical 
I, I believe they serve breakfast. If I, I, I wasn't really. the Stargate one of the locations that had the Broil Master seven thousand or whatever. It might have been the Broil Master. That's right. So let, let's read a little bit of Burma. I, I love reading him because some of his things. So. It's, it's handsomely decorated in shades of blue, mauve, and magenta. Uh, it's a particularly good bet when weather is temperate enough to allow dining on the tables in the terrace outside or when bound for World Showcase with finicky eaters in tow. Basically alluding to that you better eat your hamburger here before you go have those fine international foods over in World Showcase. Um, but it was open for breakfast. They had uh, pastries, fruit cups, blueberry muffins. Uh, but the real specialty, remember we talked about this, guys, the Stellar Scramble. Cheese, ham, onions, green pepper, scrambled eggs, and it's a breakfast pizza. So, so it's a, uh, it's a Western we omelet to... on a pizza? <laughs> yeah, on a piece of bread, okay. yeah, basically. <laughs> Lunch and dinner, as we talked about, uh, include pepperoni or cheese pizzas, hamburgers, steak sandwiches, fruit salads, and chef salads. Uh, and it stays open until the park closes. Now, I remember, let's see if we have to find a picture of this. I'll hold it up here, guys. Do you remember these the umbrellas that were there? These big con- yeah. concrete umbrellas where you could sit on the terrace. They, they were fabulous. Yeah, you were high up and you'd overlook a little reflecting pool. Yeah, that, pool. Yeah. all of that, uh, there was a, it was a reflecting pool with the stones on the bottom, which you see kind of outside between, um, uh, what is it, the seas and the land. You can see some of, yes. that, some of that waterway. And so there used to be a really nice, as, as it, like the terrace out there, and, mm-hmm. and uh, all of that has been filled in by concrete now, so you can walk over. But, yeah. but at one time, it was really like a nice kind of people watching area to sit of course it was like 95 and 100 percent humidity half the time out there but um (laughs) you know we should also mention what that restaurant became in 1994 as part of the interventions and all that that restaurant was redone it's one of the last projects that roly crump did for disney uh is that he oversaw the redesign of that into what is now the electric umbrella so the whole design of the neon in there now and the motif of the restaurant, all of that is Rolly Crump's work. Uh, so people kind of make fun of it because it's a like a plain burger joint. But I always tell people you, you should go in there, A, if you want a burger, because they're fine. Uh, but you should go in there and look around because that's, uh, that's the handiwork of one of Walt's most creative artistic imagineers. Now, do you remember the story of how the restaurant got its name? <laughs> I, I do not. Oh, vague, vaguely. So so the story that Rolly tells is that he went into the Centaurium, and much in the style of, uh, of the movie Blade Runner, they actually sold an umbrella with like a light up core. There were these, right. these umbrellas in Blade Runner that had like a neon tube in it. So someone actually made a real version of that. And he just thought that was the coolest thing. And so he took that as the inspiration and made the electric umbrella. And be sure when you're in the electric umbrella next time to look down at the carpet because the carpet has Rolly Crump designs in it too. It features those, you know, a lot of that semi psychedelic stuff that he, that he does. So much traditional, traditional stuff still around. That's just, which is pretty cool. All right. So one other thing that, that, circulated through Cupunicor East as well as a little bit West, but we're going to, we're going to cover them on this topic uh, on this episode. We talked about smart one, but we, we also had a couple other um, robots that were there. And um, Brian, you're going to, you, you, there was Jiro slash gyro and we had Seiko. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about, it wasn't just smart one. We had a couple. No. And the well. backdrop to this is that we were trying to get one of these robots for our Epcot 35th anniversary event. Uh, and so we can touch a little bit on the fate of each. There were four robots, probably of noted Epcot, Smart One being the first one, which we discussed. Smart One's eventual fate was when they took him out of Communicore. He then reappeared in the contemporary uh, as a drink-serving vessel, kind of like uh, R2-D2 on Jabba's slave ship. <laughs> um, they had him... But- Did he really? Yeah, he did- he didn't actually yes. serve the drinks, but they had him uh, set up in uh, what was it the fourth the the concourse the steakhouse concourse yeah. steakhouse uh, and so uh, he was there for a while uh, on display got knocked off and broken. Now the story that 
uh, exists out there as to his fate is that if, if WDI at that point wasn't interested in fixing him. They worked out a trade with Florida Robotics. Uh, Florida Robotics uh, took him, uh, renovated him, I believe for a time displayed him in their lobby. And then we are told sold him on eBay. Uh, I contacted Florida Robotics at the time uh, that we were planning our event, and uh, they did not respond. So there's number one. Seiko, S-I-C-O, uh, we did talk about on the Epcot opening special when we covered that. But Seiko was a robot built by an outfit whose name escapes me for the moment in uh, New York State. And uh, Seiko appeared in Rocky Three and a bunch of other movies of the 80s. And in a, it's a Rocky Four. Uh, Rocky Four. That's it. I'm sorry. The beginning of Rocky Four. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. Four. And we've kept our string of Rocky references up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, Seiko was omnipresent on television in the 80s, made all kinds of appearances, was actually designed, I think I mentioned this on a prior episode, but was actually designed to communicate with autistic children. Um, that was the original concept behind the, the robot and what he was built for. So he made all these appearances. The company that built him eventually deconstructed that original robot and kind of renovated him. So there is like Seco 2, Seco 3, Seco 4. There are others that have been built since then. You can still rent them for events. If you were doing an event up here in the Northeast, you can book the robot to come. And it doesn't look anything like the Epcot opening robot. But uh, so Seco was there. Uh, we tried to get Seco, and that Seco is no longer available. So Gyro and Gero. So Disney built these two, um, these two robots. Let's do Gyro first. So Gyro is the one that looks kind of like, uh, who was the robot made from the Jetsons or so? Um, yeah, so <laughs> Gyro is, uh, looks kind of like a, a canister trash can. And it wore a, an Epcot button and oftentimes wore an Epcot trucker hat and moved around Future World and in Communicore uh, and would interact with the guests it was on like a platform, so it could move, uh, you know, around and, and interact with people. A year after Gyro, which Gyro was 1985, in 1986, they introduced Gero, G-E-R-O, which is short for G-E Robot. And that was mostly appearing outside of the Horizons Pavilion. It was built uh, from the same GE polycarbonate material that the Horizons ride vehicles were built from, uh, all tying in with the sponsor. And uh, they, I think they kind of disappear from pictures by the late 80s, um, but they were out there for a while. Robots, it's kind of hard for people to understand now, just like touch screens and other things. Robots were a big deal in the 80s. Like everybody kind of thought by like 2000, robots would be cooking our burgers and driving our cars. And you're <laughs> right. I mean, ro robots were, yeah, you know, yeah. we're going to have a robot made. And well, here, here's a, and here's a great quote from Birnbaum regarding Gyro, um, you know, or gy Gyro, sorry. Um, you know, he says that, that the, the Gyro would ask to see someone's watch. And then announce the time as guests stare at their own watches in disbelief. You know, I mean, it could have been a small camera and so, or somebody just repeating back the time. We don't know. But it, exactly what you said, Brian, it's just robots were amazing, right? You, you, the promise of the, what they could do in the future was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so those two robots both eventually uh, went back to Disney, uh, as far as we know. Uh, they're yep. not circulating anywhere. Uh, and you never know; they might appear somewhere, someday. You know, someday. <laughs> Jiro also performed. This is interesting. You think that these robots would come out and perform for you know five, ten minutes, seven shows a day, thirty minutes each. Now, just think about battery power. We can't get a phone to last a day. <laughs> get, getting a robot in the eighties to, to last thirty minutes to do all that. The thing had to be uh, ninety percent lead acid batteries back then. Who knows? Who yeah. Knows? It's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah, it, it it really is. If you know where any of these robots have ended up, uh, let us know because we will be happy to beg the owners 
to make arrangements to have them right. at a future event. And we can put their faces on milk cartons if we need to. We, we want to find out where they are, bring them home. So we have to take a little walk um, just through the open air corridor outside the Stargate. We're heading towards Horizons now. We're going to make a right-hand side because in the window off to the right, I, I see figment spinning on some sort of contraption. And in the window, I, 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 I also see stairs and these really cool metals in a blue packet that are luring me in. I need to go in and purchase these. So where are we, Hal? Oh, you're at the Centaurium. The Centaurium. Now, we've talked about this before, but it was the store of Epcot. Um, you've heard us talk about it because it had two floors. and It had, you know, Hal was upstairs playing the Atari 50, 5200? Yeah, I think the 7800 or the 7, yeah, yeah, one of those, 58 or the yeah. uh, 52 or the 7. Hang on. We'll, we'll check <laughs> it out. So we'll, we'll, we got to get live data here. Um, but the Centaurium was uh, Epcot's main store. And uh, if you can imagine, it had a, in a way, again, sunken down, um, had a very 70s, 80s mall vibe to it with the oak railings and the glass banisters. Um, you know, like I mentioned, there was this Epcot, I'm sorry, this figment uh, figure. Classy, center, classy, you know. classy. Yeah. Very classy. And good, good stuff. You know, when you go to the center of this thing, the mugs just piled, the glasses piled up high and and good quality merchandise the ip overrun that we see today and you know mouse gear um you know what wasn't there i mean sure they're selling everything with epcot and figment on it and stuff and there were plush figments and all that but it wasn't what we see today they were also selling things that were just technology related that had nothing to do with the theme park but you you were so enthralled and so um that's the word I'm looking for. You had so much vision and, and you saw a vision and opportunity. You wanted to be part of and it. And it really it was a, a modern era. I mean, Epcot drawn up in the late 70s, early 80s, and then obviously decorated in the early 80s. It really was a modern era department store, like a higher end department mm. store is what Centurion yep. was. You could think of it almost as a sharp, parts of it is almost like a yep. sharper image, which oh, was yeah. a very popular sort of, I think they had, um, I'm sure Centurium sold one of those uh, electric chess boards that you could play against where it would move the pieces with magnets <laughs> underneath the board. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, sharper, sharper image, Hamaker Schlemmer, all sorts of cool, gadgety, scientific you know, they had to sell the spinning top that would levitate, right? You know, that was in, oh, yeah, that yeah, was, yeah, I yeah. mean, that's in every you know, sure. science museum and whatnot. Um, but it, it was, it was, it's really missed. And, and, you know, that store was actually expanded too. the, the Centaurium, you know, expanded outward. Um, I forget the exact time frame, So it became, you know, a little bit larger. It was 13,000 square feet eventually with, uh, span- Jeez, that's so big. Yeah. Spanning two levels. And, uh, you know, as we, as we've mentioned, it's, it became what is mouse gear. Now here's the interesting thing about Centaurium. I wanted to, I wanted to bring this up too. behind Centaurium. As we mentioned very early on, is there there was that walkway where you could walk the whole perimeter edge, the Communicore East. Centorium didn't go into that. When Mouse Gear came in, they busted that wall down and pushed the store all the way out. So Mouse Gear is actually bigger than Centorium was, but then when you take the second floor out, I don't, I don't know where the mm-hmm. square footage fits in. But we lost that walkway. We lost that ability to just you know walk behind and everything like that. So it's 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 really a shame how how some of that has changed. And speaking of change, I mean, we could sit here and talk about Centaurium for forever, but I, I, we, we do need to move on and, and wrap up, sadly. But um, I wanted to talk about the, the eventual changes and also some of the uh, not-so-terrific ideas that, that came into Communicore, because there, there's, there's a couple of them here. These we're going to talk about in much, much more detail on a episode called Disney Failures, which we're, we're going to have. So in 1987, we saw the circus come in. And there's all sorts of wonderful stories about uh, the the muscle men having to keep themselves pumped up behind the behind the scenes, constantly lifting weights. There's all sorts of great stories on that. So we're going to do that. And in 1993, the original fountain had all new control nozzles. What show came out of that, guys? Do you remember? No. Uh, no. It had featured creatures in black and silver and giant stilts walking through amongst disney characters if you can imagine them. i you know what i forget what that thing is called but i'll never forget yeah. that dinosaur so it was called splash tacular <sighs> and that lasted from 93 to early 94 so 
again, going on our, our failures list. Um, so what happened? Well, the first thing is that um, we have a list here, kind of the timeline as, as things changed. You know, a lot of Communicore didn't have the appeal anymore as technology started to really come around. You're getting into the mid 90s, early 90s, and even into the mid 90s, um, where things are becoming commonplace. And they really wanted to be more of stuff that you would see on an everyday basis. And I think they wanted to confuse you, as we talked about, walking through the interventions was hell compared to walking through Communicore. I mean, I think the biggest thing is all of the all of the exhibits within Communicore were all tied to the sponsors, yeah. either in Future World or World Showcase. So, you know, once those contracts were up, yeah. the 10 year contracts were done in 92. It's like it was time to refresh those because they were probably locked in for that 10 year period. It was time to do something else with the space. Right. And, you know, we talked about at the beginning how Epcot, you know, and Walt even said it's supposed to be ever changing and all that. And I think the original future, as we mentioned, was that these different pavilions would have people change out. So, I mean, it was moving interventions while we don't agree with how it was done. You know, the writing was in, was on the table when it first opened. You knew this wasn't going to survive forever. So when did it all go away? Well, uh, the electronic forum was the first one to fall in March 1991. And with every single one of these, those sunken areas were filled in with concrete. So all those sunken areas we talked about are, are, are long gone. We'll have to investigate the, the, the mouse gear one. Um, Travelport fell in April 1992. Expo Robotics, which is in Communicore West, but we'll talk about that in 93 alongside with Backstage Magic. Computer Central and Energy Exchange in 94. Futurecom and the Stargate in 94. Sunrise Terrace followed right thereafter. And then the last one to go. Do you guys remember what it was? It surprised me, actually, when I researched this. How's looking? Not puzzle? sure. Yeah, I don't know. Centorium. Hmm. 1999. So I had a good run of almost, you know, almost 17, 17 years there. That wraps up Communicore East. Um I, I loved it. I know we still have Communicore West to go through. I'm going to tell you a little bit what we'll talk about in a future episode. Um, there is so much good stuff out there in terms of the photos that are on Communicore East. So we're going to link to our gallery. There's some great video on YouTube, not only my own stuff, but as we talked about backstage magic, there's the full show. There's some just great general footage of people walking through the travel port and through the energy exchange. Uh, it was just a fantastic place to go and i think now people who visit epcot um you know you're, you're heading for soren you're heading for test track or mission space well maybe nobody heads for mission space but uh, you're heading to those attractions and because interventions and and whatever the whatever it is left right now and there's not much of it um doesn't have the draw but back then you've got to imagine that Communicore really was another pavilion. For and and there, is, there is a lot more video of it because of... Yeah. I mean, you were in there, someone was interacting, it was a fun thing for the dad to pull out a video camera, and it was a right. natural thing to tape and watch your kids and your family interact with uh, the different exhibits. Uh, it was light and airy, and unlike attractions where you were in a dark moving vehicle and... You couldn't use lighting or anything yeah. in 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 uh, Communicore. You could do all those things. So there is a lot more video of it out there if you didn't experience Absolutely. it and want to see it. And a couple, if if you are there and you want to experience some of the original building, obviously it's been changed over time. If you go to Communicore West um, and you enter to the left of Club Cool, some of the original corridor is still there with some of the original. I think they may have redone the carpet. In the, I don't know if it's original or they redid it with the Communicore a symbol on it. Um, but if you walk that, that's the original corridor. Look very carefully. You'll also see some of the original exit signs in the, in the future motif. In fact, the bathrooms I know that are right behind Communicore West that are like between Communicore West and um, the land, that area right there, there's yes. a standalone bathroom. They have a lot of the old signs on the doors. Look for it. There are remnants that are still there, but you just have to imagine a light, open breezeway. Um, there's some fantastic pictures in our galleries we talked about. Totally different feel than you have today, and it wasn't a very rushed atmosphere. Um, you go through where Mickey uh, in the character spot is now, and everything's closed in. You can't see what's going on, but you just have to imagine this big, open, airy windows looking in at all these things to do and all these things that you wanted to go do, which was really cool. And and we apologize in advance for the odor in that hallway. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> we didn't mention it. it's over in Mouse Gear, and we, we, I don't re- recall if it's, it was it's over in that in, hallway in, in when you come Centurion. around. When you come yeah. around uh, Club Cool in oh, the yeah. side hallway there, uh, the old Communicore hallway, it's 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 That's pungent. Right. So if some of you are sitting there going, "Oh man, they did they didn't talk about Epcot outreach or what, what about?" Uh, the age of information and, 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 and the, the information fountain and future com, that's all Communicore West. It was very easy to get them confused. So when we do a Communicore West episode, it was a little smaller. We had the restaurants. We also had Expo Robotics in there that came at a later time. Uh, we'll probably also throw an Earth station as well because we didn't talk about that on Spaceship, Spaceship Earth um, episodes. So we'll need to talk about that. And uh, we'll probably throw in some of the gateway gifts and camera centers and everything like that. And that way we've got the whole center area there community of uh of it set for you so i appreciate coming on with us tonight on this journey back to communicore east uh, but with that said i think brian's got with with science and technology and stem and everything in mind brian's got something important to say yeah so i i one of those uh tweets from this past year that unsu- that kind of surprisingly to me went sort of viral when uh universe of energy was closing Uh, And a lot of us old-timey Epcot fans were kind of disappointed about it. I had sent a tweet at the time that just said, you know, the the the, it's it's one of the last bits of old Epcot uh, where there was this edutainment uh, mission-oriented stuff that they were doing, uh, even though the attraction was dated. But that really that wasn't that when Epcot opened, there wasn't another forum for that a lot of places in the country. Uh, and it was neat to come to one place and see problems of transportation and medical science and things like that being discussed in a in an interesting exhibit kind of way, as opposed to watching like a Nova episode on PBS where, you know, the, the magical biography of this and that, you know. So what I said then was that the work that Epcot was supposed to be doing and that was doing when it first opened in exhibits like Communicore and the post-show areas of some of these pavilions is really being done now uh, for for families in science museums uh, around the country. In Philadelphia, we've had the Franklin Institute forever, but I remember going to it when I was a kid and going to it now really reminds me of those Epcot exhibits from the 1980s. Uh, And they are interesting and entertaining and it's fun to see. And I'll tell you where I really was gobsmacked with it was when I visited Los Angeles uh, last year and stopped to see the shuttle Endeavor, which is at the California Science Museum. And I I mean, walking through there, I felt like I was in Communicore. (laughs) It was really neat. And so I had (laughs) tweeted at the time, look, you know, you're still going to come to Epcot or whatever, but locally closer to you, there's probably a science museum in the nearest major city and you should consider patronizing it. Uh, In fact, I just joined the Franklin Institute this past year and we went to see the Terracotta Warriors exhibit um, a few weeks ago, uh, which I can see at Epcot uh, in miniaturized version, but I got to go see 10 of the actual (laughs) Chinese Terracotta Warriors and it was fascinating. Uh, great exhibit and so that's my little plug that uh, you know take your family or just on a weekend or weeknight sometime go out yourself and find the nearest science museum and pay the admission fee and take a walk through and compare it either to our description of Epcot back in the day or Epcot as it is now because all of that work is still being done Uh, it's just not I mean look I know people criticize when we say this but when you're competing with universal and you're competing with six flags and you're competing with people who are offering thrills and intellectual properties and uh there just aren't a whole that you know they do a lot of make a lot of their decisions based on guest counts and surveys and the surveys are that people don't want to pay 120 dollars a day to come and see something they can see at a science museum near them so the way to see it is go support your local science museum yeah the 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 Exploratorium in San Francisco is fantastic. There's two great science museums in Chicago. Yep. Um, we have one in Tampa. They're they're all over. And yeah, they're... yeah. The one up here, the Museum of Science in Boston, has incredible rotating exhibits. I've seen a lot of great things there, but so much great stuff, electricity demonstrations, all sorts of things. We we have also the Chris, uh, Krista McAuliffe Museum up here in New Hampshire. Uh, she was a resident. It's right up in uh, in Concord, which is and, and Alan Shepard 
is uh, also a New Hampshire rep representative. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, space history here in New Hampshire, which you wouldn't think, but there certainly is. And uh, all over the country. Um, yeah. How, what do you got down your way uh, in, in the Tampa area? So we have the Museum of Science and Industry in Tampa. So that's that's our biggest one around this area. And then there's one in Orlando, too. It used to be the John Young Museum in Planetarium, but now I think it's just called the Orlando Science Center. JT out in Ohio? Um, we have the Great Lakes Science Center. It's about an hour from here in Cleveland, right on Lake Erie. And then Columbus has COSI. And, and let's throw this out there. If you've got a cool one near where you live and we didn't mention it, email yeah. us because we'll make a list and put Let it up on the site. That would be great. And, great idea. Yeah. And when you travel, try to hit them too because that's, I know what we do. We, we you know, we're, we're traveling overseas this, this, this year and we're going to try to hit a museum over there that looks really cool. And it's got a great, a lot of science exhibits. Let me say this to our fans. Being Facebook friends with Todd, we can vouch. He goes to some of the oddest overseas museums. It's like the Museum of the Miniature Wheel and stuff like that. You know. <laughs> the, the history of, of, of a Hungarian cabinet making, though, that one was fabulous yeah. interesting. So, again, and if you see anything that reminds you of Epcot, get a picture, too. Send it to us. We'd love to see you know, uh, different exhibits that are out there that remind you architecture. I saw some great pictures of people say, oh, this looks like Communicore. This looks like Horizons. Send it all in. We love it and we'd love to share it with it. With that, our time this month is up. Um, I hope you have enjoyed our trip back to Communicore East. Um, as always, if you can, um, you know, you can give us a, a, some support at retrowdw.com forward slash support us, where we have all of our t-shirts. Hal's got some great new designs coming out. We've thrown a couple new ones up there, including the uh, the Polynesian one, which is uh, for the... Um, the Eastern the Winds. The Eastern Winds, that's right, which is yeah. a great set sail for romance with the Eastern Winds. We'll add some new ones in there as well. And I just wanted to also give a big thank you to all of our listeners. Because of your support, next month, we are all going to be speaking from new microphones, pop filters, and control arms for a whole new setup for our recording. So uh, we want to thank everybody that hopefully as we move on here, um, that our recordings are going to better quality. And um, it, without you guys, we wouldn't be able to do it. So we, we did spend a little money here that we got in. So your support is greatly appreciated. And also thank you to those. We have some recurring donors that uh, you know are sending a couple bucks each month that, that keep us going and keep the website strong. So we really do appreciate that. Um, so with that, if you can send us a review on iTunes or Google Play, if you have any questions at all, feel free to reach us at podcast at retrowdw.com. And keep checking our website this month because we have we have oh, yeah. so many slides and films uh, to share with you. And Todd and I really need to strategize on, I mean, we, we've got a backlog of about a dozen films we haven't released yet that are all written up uh, in addition to uh, uh, conservatively 750 new slides. In Easily. the last uh, two weeks, we did share, if you had missed it, we'd shared a, a set from the first six weeks of park operation, uh, 1971, uh, a whole set of slides from that that, that recently uh, came into our possession. So it's out there. Keep your eye on our website. And we do have some very new special footage uh, being transferred right now at a digital uh, digital transfer. So once we get that in, we'll restore it and work to get that out. So as Brian said, we got about a dozen or so already processed in queue, ready to get out. We've got more stuff being transferred. We've got some footage that nobody has ever seen in the quality and and the, the, the fineness of the detail. So we are looking forward to really sharing this with everybody uh, as soon as it comes out. So again, appreciate everybody's support uh, for allowing us to make this stuff happen because uh, it does take a little bit of cash in order to acquire these, convert them, um, and get them up there on the site. So as Brian was mentioning, check out the site. We've got uh, over 5,200 photos now of Retro Disney from 71 all the way up to the early 90s. Uh, it is becoming quite an undertaking to tag these, search, make them searchable. Um, and Jason uh, Bartell has been helping us out doing that and keeping the website running. And uh, we've got a lot to put up yet. So check them out a lot of good stuff all right anything else guys we want to figure out where we want to go next month i have a little idea so we are going to head next month down to the hotel plaza boulevard where there are today seven uh lodging facilities not owned by walt disney company but on disney property uh and discuss the concept of 
what was built down there and when it was built and the different iterations of the hotels, some of the amazing amenities and nightclubs and restaurants that populated uh, the hotels along there in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, the, the two suites in one of the hotels dedicated to uh, two famous Hollywood icons. And we'll also be making a pit stop at the very first thing built on Disney property, the Walt Disney World Preview Center, which still exists to this day on Hotel Plaza Boulevard. And the new tenant that's there now, are, we're going to interest you so much that they're going to be inundated with people knocking on their door and saying hey can we come in and look around your offices <laughs> can we just look at the walls because so the hotel plaza boulevard next month uh, is where we're headed and you think you'll hate it but where do you drive it <laughs> <laughs> all right well brian thanks for alluding to what we're doing next month again thank you very much to all our listeners um, we've had some great responses from you. Send your uh, any questions you've got to podcast at retrowdw.com. And with that, Brian, take us out. Follow Todd McCartney and Retro WDW on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Retro WDW. For all things Retro Disney World, including exclusive merchandise, visit us on the web at retrowdw.com. On Twitter, follow our web designer, Jason Bartell of Deepwater Studios, at JasonDWS. Our announcer, Andre Gardner, at Andre Gardner. And follow our hosts, Hal Bowers, on Twitter and Instagram, at GoAwayGreen. And on the web, at KingdomOfMemories.com. For JT Couser on Twitter, at LS1JT. On YouTube, at Rubber City Motoring. And on the web, at RubberCityMotoring.com. And you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Brian P. Miles. Music.